Namaste learners and welcome back to the senior secondary biology course of National Institute of Open Schooling. We did chapter 25 which is conservation of natural resources part 1 in our last lesson and quickly to help you recall what we did, we tried to understand what does a resource mean, what are natural resources and the difference between natural resources and human made resources. Why do we need to conserve natural resources? You remember we went through the three circles and we said the outermost circle is nature and environment within which our lives and our economic development is contained and therefore we need to conserve the natural resources if we want to conserve ourselves and our lifestyles. And then we in detail we looked at soil as one of the natural resources on how what is what does soil mean and how it can be conserved. Now in this uh, session, we the next natural resource that we are going to look at is water. The way I defined soil for you and I shared what soil means, perhaps water does not need a huge definition, is not it? Because you and I live directly on water practically every day. So I am not going to define water for you. but in your textbooks you would find and also you would have seen it perhaps as part of some of the news reporting, the media reporting that there is very limited fresh water available to us and therefore we need to conserve water resources. A very familiar chart that you would have seen is now up there on the slides which says how we have so much water on this earth, you know water, water everywhere. One third of the earth is actually land, but two third of the earth is water. That is the amount of water we have. So, what is the problem? Why are we really worrying about it? Then use it because there is so much available. That is where there is a little, uh, you know, um, uh, mystery or rather a myth that gets created in our minds. That you walk around and you see a river, you walk around, you see the lakes. Why are we worried about water? Now to help you understand this slide which is there which you are seeing where we are saying 97 percent almost 97 percent of water is not available for you and me because it is in the oceans and that is saline water and only 3 percent of the water is available to us. To help you see how little that 3 percent or the last pile that you are seeing there which is available to us the, the ground uh, surface fresh water. I will do a little activity here. Now what I am going to do is I am going to use this bottle which has a 1 litre volume to, to draw a parallel to the total water available on earth. So let us see what I am going to do. Let us take, I am going to pour this water to measure it. Now that is a litre of water that you are seeing, okay. I pour it here. Imagine this is the earth, 1 litre, one more litre that makes it 2 litre or 2000 milliliter and now I am going to do an approximate job because this is not a scientific experiment that we are doing. I need about 200 milliliter more of water which is like one fifth of this bottle. So okay, you can see this much bottle uh, water at the bottom. Let us say it is 200 milliliter, it may be 210 or it may be 185 or 190, but approximately. Now we can keep these things away. Now learners, this is all the water that is available on the earth if we equate it to 2200 milliliters or 2200, 2 liter and 200 milliliter of water. If this is the quantity of the total water available on earth, let us see how much is available for us to use. So I am going to use this spoon, the spoon with which we eat our food every day like a teaspoon and I am going to take out 
12 spoons of water. Please count with me, okay? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 and 12. It's easy to remember 12 spoons because this activity itself is called the 12 spoon activity. It's a very popular activity in classrooms. What have we done? From 2200 milliliter water that we had, we have taken out 12 spoons. What does this mean on the earth? This means all the oceans and the seas. So, the 2200 milliliter of water minus 12 spoons is completely not usable for human beings, not even for agriculture because this is all ocean and sea and saline water. Therefore, what does the 12 spoon mean? Of course, as you are seeing in the first pillar also in the slide that the block that I have created for you, the topmost part is this which is the fresh water. Just 12 spoons is all the fresh water that we have. Can you see the proportion between these two? Saline and fresh water. Wait, this is not where the activity ends and it's called 12 spoons. There is some more shocking news for us. What does that news mean? From these 12 spoons, which is fresh water, which has no salt in it, now I will remove two spoons. Let's do that. One and two. This has now 10 spoons. We will come back to it later. What have we done here? What is the next step? And you will see it on the slide in the next block. Of the 12 spoons, 2 spoons is logged inside the ground. What we have here is the ground water. Yes, and I have titled it for you. It's the ground water. Of the 12, 2 is inside the ground. If we need to use it, we need to invest energy because we cannot dig it out without using power. So this is again logged inside the ground and it's gone. Come back to the remaining fresh water, 10 spoons left here. So we come back to this and we take now only half a spoon. Okay, I've taken half a spoon, nine and half spoons of water here out of 10. We began with 12. Two logged inside the ground, 10 remaining here, half I have taken, 9 and half here. This half that I am pouring into the glass, what is it like? These are the fresh water lakes. So of the 10 spoons that remained in the fresh water after putting the water inside the ground, half a spoon is, is into the lakes. 9 and half remained here. Now I just need to take a drop. I wish I had a dropper, but it's okay. I just need to pour little drop. Okay. And I hope I can manage to pour just a drop, which you will not be able to see through the camera. I've just poured a drop of water in it. And what is it? These are the rivers. Wow, I finally able to pour just one drop of water in this last glass. Remember? And that's reverse. Learners, this is how nature gave fresh water to us. Because this is the only water which is available to us without any effort. Naturally, human beings and all the other life forms which live on land and not in the seas are expected to survive out of this water. So I repeat, 2200 milliliter of water, total water on the earth. We took 12 spoons out of it. That is the complete fresh water available to us. Of the 12 spoons, 2 spoons have gone underground and it's called the ground water. From the remaining fresh water, we took half a spoon and those are the fresh water lakes. And from the remaining nine and, half, nine and half spoons of fresh water, we took a drop of water 
which is the reverse for us. Remember the mighty Ganges, the Brahmaputra, they are all a part of this little drop in the glass. Now there is a very good question, I do not know if it has come to your minds or not, then what does this water mean? It is still there and it is fresh water, is not it? Can not we use this so much water? No dear learners, that is where we are wrong. The remaining 9 and half minus a drop of water which is there in this glass, it is logged in the ice caps and the glaciers. It is not available to us in the direct form for use. Okay. I hope the 12 spoon activity brings a realization to us that this is a very precious resource and it needs to be conserved. So remember in our first lesson we were convinced why we need to conserve soil. I hope you are now convinced why we need to conserve fresh water even when we feel there is so much water on the earth. See the difference. Okay, so we will get back to the slides quickly and we will see what can you and I do to conserve our water. What are some of the steps in which we can conserve? The way we talked about soil and soil conservation, it is very similar to that. The more vegetation we grow, the more water that falls from the rainfall, we are able to retain on land. Because remember, by nature what happens? Whenever there is rainfall, there is the fall off that goes to the oceans. So nature gives us fresh water in the form of rains. If we do not capture it then and there, it will go and meet the seas and the oceans and it will become non-usable for us. And if we want to use, again we will need power to use it. So we should help retain as much rainwater on land as possible and growing more vegetation and trees is a very simple way to do that. The second way perhaps which is a little debatable but I will come to you about what the debate around this topic is. That ultimately the rivers which, which have the fresh water in them, they also ultimately go and meet the sea. Now one of the technologies that human beings have created is to retain part of river water from reaching the ocean directly. And to do that, we have built dams for numbers of years now. So the other step through which fresh water can be conserved is by building dams and reservoirs. But many of you who read newspapers, who listen to the media, you would have seen there is a great controversy around dams. Should dams be built? Are they good? Are they not so good? Well, like any other aspect in our lives, dams also have two sides to it, like a coin. Yes, there is not so desirable side, which is that when we build a dam, there are two things that happen parallelly. A large amount of water is saved from flowing into the river and we need a lot of space and volume to store that water. Very often because of the path of the river itself, this space needs to be in a forest area because that is where usually the rivers flow from. When we do that, we are doing two things which as, as homo sapiens we should not do, as, as human beings for environment we should not do. One, we are removing the forest because you have to cut the forest to create the reservoir. And in the forest, a number of species also live and they also get displaced. That is one thing which is environmentally not desirable. But then there is second thing as well which is socially not desirable. In these forests, a number of tribes and other human communities live. Some of them live there and some of them live in the nearby villages but they get their livelihood and their income using those forest resources. So the minute we create the reservoir, the forests are gone, the species, the different life forms, trees, animals, small creatures, birds who live there, they are gone. But at the same time, those tribal communities and other rural communities which dependent on the forest, they are also gone. They have to look for something else. 
So environmentally and socially, dams are not desirable. But we still say that if we need to conserve this little drop of water, we need dams. Well, there is another way. Instead of creating big and huge dams, we can create smaller dams as well and a series of smaller dams so that we don't lose on large areas of forest and we do not lose on communities who otherwise were living in that forest area. And your textbook does have an example of smaller ways of retaining this water and I will also come to it later in my presentation. Okay, that was about dams. Another thing that we can do to conserve water and not pollute it is to limit the sewage that flows into the water bodies. Ultimately, the not desirable water or the polluted water that comes out of my house, your houses, industries, factories, it all has to ultimately meet the water pool. Remember, through the rivers, it will go here in the oceans. Now, we don't want this to get polluted. We don't want this to get polluted. So, what do we do? We create sewage treatment plants. So, and what does these plants do? They take the dirty or the polluted water, that is the input to the plants. A number of physical, chemical and biological processes are done in the sewage treatment plant and the output water is comparatively not as bad and as polluted as the input water. When that water is discharged into a river or into the oceans and the sea, nature has the capacity to do away with that pollution and create good water out of it. So it does not affect the environment and the water in the rivers. Same can be done for the discharge which is coming out of industries. The industrial discharges can also be treated. The last two points that I am coming to is what you and I can do very easily. A very simple way to conserve water and remember if 7 billion people do it on earth, it is a huge contribution is to take only half a glass of water if I am thirsty only for half a glass. Not take a full glass and then throw it into down the drain because remember it will become sewage. It won't remember water, remain water anymore. So please use water judiciously. Engineers are trying to help us. There used to be taps which used to be open fully, you know, and when we are brushing our teeth, we would be very, very lazy to close it completely, you know. Who will do it so many times? Engineers have helped us. Now just one click, the water opens and one click, the tap closes. Can we at least now be more judicious in using the water? If I am brushing my teeth, I am taking bath, can I ensure that I am not wasting that water? Because the water coming out of tap is very good quality. But the minute I use it and it goes into the drain, it becomes sewage and it leads to a lot of pollution. The last thing that can be done if we have the right resources and right technology and we have it today is to again capture the rainwater as and when it falls. So rainwater harvesting either on the roofs or underground tanks stored within our houses, within our official and commercial buildings is something which is very much doable at a society level. So a society of residents can come together and do it, an office building can do it and we know there are cities like Chennai and Delhi in our own country which are doing a huge amount of work for rainwater harvesting. Okay, so much for water. You remember the glass that I showed, now there is a lot of water here but there was only one drop which was the river. It is not just for you and me, it is also for all the life forms which need fresh water on this earth. Who are these life forms? Well, that is what we call as biodiversity. So as you can see on the slide, while human beings are there, there are a number of other creatures which cohabit this earth with us. They sh we share the earth with them and they have as much right to live as you and me. They need the soil that we talked about in part one. They need the water that we did talk about recently, but they also need the forests, the lakes, the deserts, wherever they are living. The minute we disturb these ecosystems, we disturb the life form that exists around us. We disturb the biodiversity 
and biodiversity is nothing but the sum total of variety of life forms from bacteria, viruses and microbes to the big sharks and the whales and elephants and giraffes together all of them are referred to as biodiversity. Why do we really need biodiversity? Well, there are four clear categories for which we need biodiversity. One is the material use. Because if there are no plants, we will, what will we feed into our factories? So if we need clothes, we need the fiber. Where does the fiber come from? It comes either from the cotton or from the silk. The silkworm has created, but you need the silkworm to get silk out of it, isn't it? So there is a lot of material use. It could be minerals, it could be fibers, it could be food that we need the biodiversity form for. That's the first reason. The second reason why we need biodiversity is to ensure that mons during monsoon months, we get the rains. During summer months, we feel the temperature and winters do come in time. It is the biodiversity, largely the oceans and the forest that regulate climate for us. Imagine if there was no Indian Ocean and there was no Bay of Bengal, do you think India would have a monsoon type climate? We get monsoons because we have the oceans around us. They regulate the climate that we experience on our, the Indian subcontinent, the peninsular region. That's a very small example. But at overall earth level as well, at the whole planet level, it's largely the forests and the oceans that make us happy living here, which keeps the temperature within the range that we feel comfortable living at and also other life forms, right? So they also need biodiversity because they need the right climate and right temperatures to live at. The third reason is, again, you remember the chapter, the previous chapter, Principles of Ecology? We talked about the energy flow and we talked about nutrient cycling. And we know if these were not there, we would not get the food on, food on our plate. So to have nutrients in place and to get all the energy that we and other species need to live, we need biodiversity. We need a variety of plants and we need a variety of animals. Last but not the least, something that you would feel very appealed with is that, you know, during holidays, where will we go? What would we do? When do we pack our bags? A lot of you either want to go for trekking, you want to go for camping, some of you want to see the big wildlife, the tiger and the elephant and you go to the protected areas. Well, so our recreation is also a reason for which we need biodiversity. And it's exactly for this reason that we need to conserve it. How do we conserve biodiversity? Don't get confused about the terms that you are seeing there in situ, ex situ. Just remember in means the place where that species or that life form is found. Save it where it is found. So if tigers are found in the grasslands, save them there. If lions are found in scrubland, save them there. If there is a spider on the wall in our house, save it there. That effort is called in situ conservation. Protect them wherever they are. Don't disturb their houses. Don't disturb their homes and habitats. Sometimes that is not possible. Sometimes we also need to take them out and protect them. And when we take them away from their natural habitat and protect them in some other place, a scientifically designed place, then it's called the XC2, X exit. That means they've exited from their habitat and moved, have been conserved somewhere else. So there are two types of conservation. Capture them and protect them where they are. And if required, then take them out and scientifically design a place to conserve them. Well, India is a very, very biodiversity rich country, very rich. You know, the United Nations has something called biodiversity hotspots. As the name says, like hotline, that means it's very important. Similarly, hotspots. These are spots of biodiversity, very important to be conserved. Why? There are two reasons why they need to be conserved and those are the two points in definition of hotspots. They are very important because they con contain large number of species. So any, an area which contains more than 1500 of species which are found in that area only, like 
I'll give you an example like the Asiatic lion. It's found only in certain part in a location of Gujarat called Gir. It's not found anywhere else in this world. So Asiatic lion is endemic to that part of Gujarat. So an area which contains at least 1500 of sub, such species and at the same time sadly 70% of these species and life forms are threatened then you need to conserve them. Now you realize why they are hotspots because these species are not found anywhere else in the world and at the same time wherever they are found in that little area they are threatened they may be no more tomorrow. So the United Nations and the national governments including the government of India puts a lot of conservation effort around these areas. In India there are two such locations the Western Ghats which is down parallel to, uh, to the ocean down south and the Eastern Himalayas which is largely in the northeastern area of our country. These two are two hotspots of the total 36 hotspots that exist in the world today. I talked about in situ conservation, protect them where they are and government of India is doing a large amount of effort in ensuring that we protect this biodiversity. So there are three categories of areas that we are protecting and hotspots are a part of it. If I have to technically define it for you, there are national parks, there are sanctuaries and there are biosphere reserves. There is very fine distinction between these two but it is important to understand if we need to conserve biodiversity. National parks are those areas where no human activities is allowed. There is a core area. Every national park has a core area. Within that range and limit come whatsoever no human activity will be allowed. So even if people live in a nearby village, they will not be allowed to move into that area. Around the core area, there are periphery area also which need to be saved in these natural areas. If we want to save the lion, not just the core area because a lot of animals whom the lion feeds on depend on the peripheral area as well. In these area, the human activity may be allowed but not cutting of trees and <laughs> trees at all. But yes, if so if there are bay leaves, if there are forest produce that local villagers want to go and pick, uh, maybe there are the tendu leaves and they want to make beedis out of it. There is the tej patta or the bay leaf, the trees there and they are fallen and they want to pick. Those activities are allowed in the peripheral areas. But core and heart of a national park is absolutely no for human beings. That's a small difference that national parks and sanctuaries have. Sanctuaries do allow some amount of human activity in all parts of the sanctuary. So sometimes you may see a tractor going into the sanctuary and that's legally allowed. But there are ways to do it. So one needs to take permission to do that. Third category of protected areas is the biosphere reserves. UNESCO, one of the UN organizations specializes in something like this. The way biosphere reserves is a little different from national parks and sanctuaries is that these are also large natural areas where the life forms are protected but at the same time the communities that live there, their culture, their lifestyle that is also documented and protected. So biosphere reserves not just has wildlife but it also have humans as part of it and their everyday living life, culture, lifestyle traditions as part of it. So these are three key uh, ways in which government of India and our state governments are trying to protect the biodiversity for us. So we looked at these resources and what I have for you which is also there in the textbook, you have a list of some of the key protected areas, national parks and wildlife sanctuaries given in the textbook. I have just tried to put some of those on the map of India, I referred it and uh, you know to name a few, if you want to see the tiger, where would you go? You know, a very popular name that comes to most Indians' mind is Kana. We will go to Kana Tiger Reserve, which is in Madhya Pradesh. Or, uh, or I will go to Sariska, which is, which is in Rajasthan, but very close to Delhi. So in case you are interested, where do you go when you want to see, say, uh, say the, the bear or the sloth bear or say um, the chinkara, these species. So there are different zones where a particular species is the focus 
of that particular conservation effort and the map of India is available for you to explore it more. The last part of our discussion today is we talked about ex situ as well. Many times it is not possible to save the complete habitat for a particular species or maybe it is already degraded and if we don't do any effort the species may get lost very soon. So what do you do? If it's a plant species you bring seeds back home and then there are large number of seed banks being maintained by various governments in our country. Gene banks, seed banks that's an example. But another, uh, the other two examples are very commonly available to visitors and I'm sure learners, many of you have visited them, the zoo or the botanical gardens. Now that's also a way that scientists try to save those species which are threatened in wild. So we bring a lot of those species and protect them. There are breeding programs, scientific breeding programs that go in the zoological gardens and botanical gardens as well. So these are some of the ways in which ex situ, we have taken them out where they belong but we are still trying to protect them because we do not want to lose those species from the nature. But friends there is also one thing that what we are doing today perhaps is something that we have inherited from our previous generations. You know Indian communities traditionally have been very wise communities and they have looked at natural resources in a very wise manner. I am going to give two quotes here. One is and both of them are live traditions even today, they are not dead. One is example of sacred groups. What are the sacred groups? They are like the temples of nature where worship is done of animals, trees, forests, other species which are found in that area. So a large number of communities especially in southern India and northeastern India they do not allow the forest areas of this patch to be touched. All the only interaction they have in these forest areas is to create smaller temples, go there, offer prayers to the species and the natural wealth found there and come back. No human activities allowed absolutely. It's as good as say a temple in a city as well. You know you would not allow things to be cut or removed in a temple. Similarly, these communities called, they, these are very sacred for them, they are their god and they call them sacred groups. So a lot of biodiversity in India is getting protected by these communities through sacred groups. Chipko example, I am not going to detail out, it is something very common that in, in Garhwal, which was then later on led by the legend uh, Sundarlal Bahugunaji, in Garhwal when the forests were being cut, it was the local women who came and said, if you want to slash the tree, slash us first. They stuck to the tree and that's called the Chipko movement. So those communities also exist. The last very common example from Rajasthan and Haryana, because these have hills, hills which are old, because Aravali is one of the oldest ranges of mountain. So Aravali naturally today don't have very dense forest to save the water rainfall that comes on it. And this typically the rainfall in the catchment area is protected by local community out of which a little lake is created. Now remember I was talking about big dams and small dams. Johars use small dams. Small dams that do no harm to the local biodiversity. It doesn't do harm to the forests and the communities there but yet it creates a small reservoir of, for water that is available throughout the year after a good monsoon system. So well, conservation has been something which has been a part of Indian tradition and lifestyle and therefore when it comes to sustainable development, striking a balance between the economy, the society, you remember the three circles where we started and we said the outermost circle is that of the environment, well it is the environment that needs to be saved if we want to save our economy and society and this is the fundamental principle of sustainable development. That if for development, human development needs to be sustained, the environment needs to be sustained. And that's where your chapter in the textbook ends. It ends with sustainable development. It's not just about you and me, but it's for the generations to come. What you see on your slides is a very standard definition of sustainable development that save this earth the way you received it from your ancestors. 
So the earth doesn't belong to us. We are just the caretaker of it. We received it off from our grandparents and we need to hand it over in a healthy way to the next generation which is going to come to the future generation. That is the crux of sustainable development. So natural resources, conserving them and ensuring that we are developing, that India is developing in a sustainable manner. That's what this chapter is all about. I hope you enjoyed interacting with me as much as I enjoyed putting this together for you. Thank you learners.